Um, also, we will wrap up questions with Dave at 1.30 p.m. Um, and then those who would like to stay on for a bonus presentation from Ohio Native Plant Month are welcome to. We have a couple of ONPM folks in the audience here today, and they'll give us a quick 10 minute talk about their organization. Um, right. So I wanted to give a quick introduction to Tinker's Creek Watershed Partners. We are a watershed focused 501c3 nonprofit located in Northeast Ohio and Twinsburg specifically. Um, our mission is to protect and restore water quality and habitats in Tinkers Creek and Brandywine Creek watersheds through community partnerships. We engage in stream restoration projects, public outreach and education. Uh, we support our member communities around stormwater and related issues. And we do webinars like these. We also host the NowCore program. Um, that's the program I'm in, the Northern Ohio Watershed Corporation, where members volunteer for a year of service to maintain water quality through, throughout Northern Ohio through stewardship, ed education, and conservation. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. And then at the end of the um, Dave's presentation, I'll direct him your questions. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dave. Thanks very much, Nina, um, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, so yeah, my name is Dave. I'm from Meadow City Native Plant Nursery, and we are a, um, a native plant nursery uh, located in Cleveland, and um, every all the plants that we sell are grown from seed collected in Northeast Ohio from naturally occurring native populations. So um, I'm the education specialist with the nursery. So um, part of that is, um, you know, being involved with giving presentations like this. So um, great, I'll go ahead and get started. And today's presentation is entitled A Time for Bumblebees, Native Plants in the Garden and a Pollinator's Life Cycle. Okay, great. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started uh, giving some background on native plants. I know a lot of you folks are probably familiar with the subject, but um, there might be some new information here for you uh, regardless. So native plants are simply the plants that are growing in an area purely as a result of natural phenomena. Uh, they weren't uh, introduced by people. So in most cases, this means these plants have been here for a very long time, uh, thousands of years at least. Long ago, these plants colonized the landscape through their own seed dispersal, and they were looking for spots that had the soil properties that were best for their growth. So some plants wanted acidic soil, some plants wanted basic soil, some plants wanted soil that retained a lot of water, and they grew in these places. And as a result, after a lot of time, there is a very cool correspondence between soil maps and maps of native plant communities. And this is true in Ohio. So uh, on the left is a map of Ohio's glacial deposits, and this is simply the soil material that was left behind when the glaciers retreated at the end of the last ice age. And these deposits varied in those properties that I was talking about. On the right is a map of Ohio's native plant communities. And um, you can, and these are just the plants that were present prior to European colonization. You can see how closely these two maps resemble one another. And I really like this. It's almost like uh, the native plants are an extension of the soil itself. Now, uh, in Northeast Ohio, our dominant native plant community is the beech maple forest. And this is named for our two most abundant forest trees, the beech and the maple. Um, but there are lots of other native plants that are a part of that community. And indeed, there are many other native plant communities in Northeast Ohio. Okay, so since native plants have been here for so long, it has given the regional wildlife the time to evolve the ability to use these plants as a food source. This is a really long, slow process, but what it means is that today, our wildlife can eat native plants, but in a lot of cases, cannot eat non-native plants. So plants that were recently introduced from another part of the world, our wildlife oftentimes cannot eat those plants because our wildlife doesn't have the evolutionary adaptations to eat those plants. And this is true for many of our bees. 
20 to 45 percent of our bees are what's called pollen specialists. So this means that their larvae can only consume the pollen from a very narrow range of plants, and usually those plants need to be native. On the left here, we have um, a pollen specialist bee called the spring beauty mining bee. So the larvae of the spring beauty mining bee can only consume the pollen of the wildflower spring beauties. So therefore, uh, this bee has a life cycle which is intimately tied with spring beauties. The bee's distribution is uh, the geographic range aligns almost exactly with spring beauties and the time when the bee is active uh, is exactly when spring beauties are in flower. Now on the right, we have another pollen specialist bee, and this is the hairy banded mining bee. Now this bee has larvae that can only consume the pollen of goldenrods. So this bee is going to be active during the fall when the goldenrods are in bloom, and uh, its life cycle is intimately tied to goldenrods. Now in addition to pollen specialist bees, there are many other animals who are dependent on native plants. And um, indeed, 90% of our plant eating insects are specialists and most of them are going to require native plants. Okay, so all this wildlife that's depending on native plants, how's it doing? Unfortunately, the trends are not good. Um, looking at Ohio specifically, just in the past 20 years, there has been a 33% decrease in butterfly abundance. So that's one out of every three butterflies gone. And that's just in the past 20 years. Pictured here, we have a beautiful butterfly called the Aphrodite fertility, and it's nectaring on um, the aptly named butterfly weed. The Aphrodite fertility is one of the species that is in steep decline. Looking at bumblebees, 26% uh, of our native bumblebee species are threatened with extinction. This means that 20 years ago, bees that were common, like the rusty patched bumblebee pictured here, have declined steeply. And now the rusty patched bumblebee um, is very difficult to find. Uh, the population's really dropped off just in the past 20 years. Here one is pictured um, on our native wild bergamot, which is an absolute bee favorite of a wildflower. Looking at higher levels of the food chain, in the past 50 years, there has been a 29% decrease in bird abundance. That's almost one out of every three birds gone in the past 50 years. Birds like the bobolink, pictured here, have fallen off steeply. This, this species indeed has declined by 56% in the last 50 years. It's a, um, a grassland bird. I love the way that its plumage is described. It's been said it looks like the bird is wearing a backwards tuxedo. And I think it's a perfect description and certainly we need to save this and other species. Um, so there are a lot of factors contributing to these trends. Uh, this would include insecticide usage, introduction of novel pathogens, but overall the uh, number one factor causing our decreases in wildlife abundance is habitat loss. And this habitat loss is stemming from agricultural expansion and increasing urbanization. Here we have a picture of the typical scenario. You have an area of uh, forest habitat that's been uh, greatly fragmented through uh, urban expansion. Okay, now the good news is we have a huge opportunity to turn things around and to create habitat simply by planting native plants in our yards. And the reason I say this is because in the US, we have 40 million acres of lawn. It's a huge area and the lawn does not provide food or shelter for wildlife. If we convert just a fraction of this space into um, native plant landscaping, then we really will have created a large amount of very valuable habitat for our wildlife. Now, as we're, you know, landscaping for wildlife and thinking about helping wildlife, one group of organisms that I think is especially useful to keep in mind are the bumblebees. And the reason I like to uh, focus on bumblebees first off is because they're interesting. And I say this because uh, bumblebees are social, whereas the vast majority of the world's bees are solitary. 
90% of the world's bees are solitary. So this means the mother bee, uh, she creates a nest. She puts pollen and nectar into that nest. She lays her eggs. Then she seals up the nest and she leaves. Uh, probably within a few weeks, she passes away. And that's kind of the story of that nest's creation. But it's different with bumblebees because they're social. So with bumblebees, the mother bee and her offspring work together to create and care for more offspring and to care for the nest. And everyone has their own job. So if you look at this picture on the left, the large bee in the center, that's the mother bee, that's the queen. And uh, her job is to lay eggs and to incubate those eggs. She is surrounded by her daughter bees, the workers, and their job is to forage for nectar and pollen, to feed the larvae, and also to take care of the regular nest maintenance. Now you might be thinking, well, what about the sons? What are they doing? Well, they have a job too. They only have one job. And that job is to mate with next year's queens from other nests. So once those sons who are called the drones are mature, they leave the nest. They don't come back. They hang out around the flowers of the field waiting for an opportunity to mate with a next year's queen from another nest. Another reason that I think it's really useful to focus on bumblebees is because they're outstanding pollinators. And remember, pollination is necessary for plants to reproduce. 90% um, of the, well, actually 80% of the world's plants are reliant on bees for performing their pollination. And bumblebees are like super pollinators because they have a number of physical adaptations. So I'm gonna talk about a few of those now. First off, bumblebees uh, are able to better warm their bodies than other bees can. This is because they're large, they're quite hairy, and they're able to vibrate their flight muscles in order to generate some internal heat. So because of this, bumblebees can be active for um, a very long time during the year out there pollinating plants. This picture on the left is a queen bumblebee in the springtime, probably in the month of April, pollinating Dutchman's britches. So these queens are one of the only bees that's out at this time. And indeed, Dutchman's britches has evolved to be solely pollinated by queen bumblebees. They're the only bees, let alone that are out, but that are strong enough to open up those flowers and to access uh, the reproductive structures. Now on the right, we have uh, a plant called frost aster. This plant blooms sometimes even into November. And even at that time of year, there are oftentimes still bumblebees that are out uh, visiting the plant and pollinating the plant. Another reason that bumblebees are great pollinated pollinators is because they can do buzz pollination. So this is a special kind of pollination that a lot of bees don't know how to do. And it's focused on pollinating plants that are holding their pollen internally. So a lot of plants like tomatoes, they actually hold their pollen internally. And in order for the pollen to be released, it needs the plant needs to be shaken. Only some bees know how to do that shaking and bumblebees are one of the bees that does it. They latch on to the flower and they vibrate those flight muscles uh, to release the pollen. Another reason that bumblebees are great pollinators is because they can pollinate the entire range of flower shapes. If you look uh, at the lower part of the slide, you see the common flower shapes. Some of these are tough for a bee to access. The bilabiate flower shape and the carinate flower shape in particular, those can be difficult flowers to open up. And a lot of bees just don't have the size and strength to get it done. But bumblebees are bigger than most bees. Uh, if you look at the photo uh, in the top right, you can see the bumblebee compared to some other native bees. Uh, compared to the green metallic sweat bee and the sweat bee, the bumblebee is almost twice as big. Bumblebees also have extremely long tongues. At least most of them do. This is kind of bizarre, but it's the truth. 
And this allows them to pollinate long tubular flowers. Um, so flowers that have uh, a very long corolla, uh, those sweat bees that we just looked at, they're not going to be visiting those flowers because they can't access the nectar that's at the nectary at the base of that corolla, but bumblebees can. So another reason why bumblebees are great pollinators is because they're generalists. So I talked earlier about the pollen specialist bees that forage only on uh, certain flowers when they are out foraging for pollen. Bumblebees aren't like that. Bumblebees will forage on a very wide range of flowering plants. So that means their pollination footprint is gonna be larger than those other bees. Um, now I should add that pollen specialist bees do forage on other flowers when they're foraging for nectar. Um, so their pollen footprint is larger than just their host species as well. But uh, the bumblebee at no point in its life cycle is it going to be restricting itself to only certain flowers. It'll, it'll uh, visit a wide range. But the bumblebee, even though it's visiting a wide range of flowers, it has a really cool habit of doing it systematically because the bumblebee uh, shows floral constancy in its foraging. What this means is the bumblebee is going to visit flowers of a given species in order before moving on to flowers of the next species when it's foraging in a patch of ground. So in this picture, for instance, we have a purple cone flower in the foreground and we have black eyed Susans in the background. This bumblebee is going to move from this purple cone flower to the next purple cone flower and so on. And then it's going to move on to the black eyed Susans. By doing so, it's increasing the probability that it's going to deposit purple cone flower pollen on a purple cone flower where it's actually going to pollinate the plant, as opposed to depositing on a black eyed Susan where it's not going to accomplish anything. So that's a really important trait of the bumblebee foraging. Okay, so what I want to do now is focus in more on uh, specific times uh, in the bumblebee life cycle. And we're going to examine a series of native plants that are especially useful to the bumblebee throughout its life. And we're going to talk about why those plants are great for the home garden and what other wildlife is benefiting from those plants. So first off, I'm gonna mention uh, little blue stem. So little blue stem is a native bunch grass. Um, what that means is that it's growing in tidy clumps or tussocks. Bunch grasses don't tend to be as aggressive as sod grasses. So grasses, uh, like many turf grasses, will spread over uh, a large space. This is also true oftentimes of big blue stem and some of our uh, more aggressive native grasses. Little blue stem isn't like that. It forms these neat tussocks of grass. And so therefore, it's a perfect plant for planting in and among your wildflowers and offering a textural uh, contrast. It also has great color on its own. Um, you can see it gets this lovely bluish green foliage during the growing season. And then on into the fall and winter, it gives color in those seasons too. You don't have to worry about your garden just being a drab dead space because little blue stem has this rich reddish orange coloration that uh, it offers to those seasons. Little blue stem does great in dry soils and it does great in nutrient poor soils. So if you've got a dry spot in your yard, this could be a really nice plant for uh, you know filling in that space and uh, offering some uh, aesthetic value. So let's check in on the bumblebee life cycle and see what little blue stem is doing for it. So in the springtime, um, usually around April, the queen bumblebee is going to emerge from hibernation. She's going to come out from uh, usually a shallow depth underground, and she's going to start looking for a spot where she can start her nest. And she's looking for cavities. This bee is a cavity nester. It could be either below ground or above ground. Oftentimes, the queen bumblebee 
will focus on a rodent burrow, maybe uh, tunnels in the earth that have been created by a vole or a, or, or a groundhog. Sometimes they'll nest uh, in an old mailbox, but one of the places they really like to nest is at the base of bunch grasses like little blue stem. Oftentimes there is a thatch that accumulates at the base of the grass. It's a cavity laden space that's sheltered and protected and bumblebees oftentimes like to nest at the base of a grass called little blue stem. So, uh, or a grass like little blue stem. So um, here for instance, we have a photograph of a bumblebee that's uh, entering its nest at the base of a grass tussock. Now, little blue stems wildlife benefits aren't restricted just to bumblebees, but also it's a host plant for a group of butterflies called the grass skippers. The grass skippers are small, fast flying, furry bodied butterflies, and their caterpillars uh, are reliant on the foliage of lots of our native grasses. So if you plant little blue stem, you could be supporting this charismatic group of uh, butterflies. And the fact that their bodies are so hairy, that uh, aids them uh, you know, in transferring pollen from plant to plant. Little blue stem also produces seeds that are a great food source for lots of our birds. Uh, pictured here, we have a white-throated sparrow. I urge you to look up the song of the white-throated sparrow. Uh, it's a lovely kind of melancholy call. And you hear that during times of migration here in Ohio. Um, White-throated sparrows and other songbirds really like the seed of little blue stem. All right, moving on. The next plant that I'd like to highlight for its value to bumblebees is wild blue indigo, uh, Baptisia australis. So this plant is kind of unusual because it's blooming early, so it's blooming primarily during the month of May, but it's a large showy wildflower. Usually uh, the way it works with native plants is the later in the season, the larger the plants get. Here you have a plant that puts on a lot of biomass early and puts on a spectacular floral show. So uh, the first few years, this plant is gonna be investing its energy into its root, root growth. So it's not gonna be all that noteworthy what's going on above ground. But with time, it's gonna send up a lot of stems and it's gonna attain sort of a shrubby appearance. Uh, you're gonna wanna give this plant some space. It grows to about four feet tall. It's gonna have its best development in areas of full sun, but due to its extensive roots, it has good tolerance for dry soil uh, and also for nutrient poor zones. Okay, so what is this plant uh, doing for bumblebees? Let's check in on the bumblebees. All right, so last off, last time we were talking about the bumblebees, the queen bumblebee was searching for a nest and she had decided she was gonna build her nest at the base of the little blue stem tussock. What she does after that, oftentimes during the month of May, is she's foraging for, uh, you know, food for herself, specifically nectar. And in her nest, she builds this structure on the left side of the photo called the nectar pot. And that's where she's gonna store the nectar that is her own form of refreshment. She's also getting started with her, uh, you know, raising her offspring. So what she does is she forages for nectar and pollen, creates a series of uh, nectar and pollen balls, and then she lays eggs on each of those, covers them with wax and incubates them. And that's what she's doing in this photo. Now, um, one of her favorite flowers to forage on is wild blue indigo. And the reason the plant is so valuable to the queen bumblebee is because wild blue uh, indigo has evolved a flower structure. It's that carinate structure that I talked about earlier. That is very difficult. <laughs> it, it takes some size and strength to open it up, but the bumblebee can do it. And here's a great image right here of a bumblebee um, basically accessing the floral rewards in a wild blue indigo flower. Um, and because other bees can't access those rewards, there's extra pollen and nectar 
for the bumblebees. So this is one of the favorite plants for these queen bees to forage on when they're first getting their nest started in the month of May. Other ecological points to emphasize with wild indigo. First off, um, this plant is interesting because of the extensive nature of its root system. Um, I came across a really cool description of this. The woman said uh, from a native plants group, it was like a steel octopus. And I think that's just a, a, perfect, <laughs> a perfect description of the root system of wild blue indigo. Um, it has a you know, deep branching sort of taproot system that can go down below seven feet into the soil. And uh, this endows the plant with the drought tolerance I was talking about before. But also what this means is the plant is going to be enriching the soil throughout that zone because this plant has a symbiotic relationship with bacteria, which allow uh, the conversion of atmospheric nitrogen into uh, soil nitrogen that can be um, uh, basically a fertility resource for the plants. So if you have a nitrogen deprived soil, wild blue indigo will do just fine. And in fact, it's going to uh, add nitrogen to that soil. Another aesthetic aspect of wild blue indigo that's really cool is it has these interesting large dark seed pods. And those are gonna develop later in the year. So it's not just adding aesthetic interest when it's in flower, but also later in the year with its curious seed pods. Okay, so moving on into the month of June, the next wildflower that I would recommend is a plant called smooth penstemon. So smooth penstemon is great because it has, first of all, really cool looking flowers. Uh, you know, they have this kind of puffy tubular look to them. And this is an example of that bilabiate um, flower shape that I was talking about before. So it's gonna add variety to your garden, uh, having this plant growing there. Also, this plant is blooming at a time when not a lot of other wildflowers are blooming. There's sometimes a spring flush of floral blooms. And then also later in the summer, but not so much during the month of June. Smooth penstemon fills that gap really nicely. It's also super versatile. You can plant this plant in a range of soil moisture and also a range of sunlight. It could do full sun to partial shade. All right, so let's check in with the bumblebees and see what the plant is offering to bumblebees at this time. So during the month of June, uh, by mid-June, those first larvae that were starting up last time we checked in with the queen bee, those have, those have reached maturity. And now they're assisting the queen bee in her tasks. Previously, she was the one who was doing all of the foraging and the feeding of her young. But now this generation of daughters is gonna pitch in. So the mother, uh, the queen bumblebee, she's just gonna focus on laying the eggs and incubating them, whereas her daughters are gonna take over a lot of the foraging and uh, the feeding tasks. Now, one of their favorite uh, plants to forage on during this time is, you guessed it, smooth penstemon. Um, the flower structure is uh, you know, perfect for the bumblebees. They climb right in there to uh, access that pollen and nectar. And also it makes them very effective pollinators of this plant. Now, another uh, pollinator that really enjoys smooth penstemon is a bee called the small carpenter bee. Now, uh, small carpenter bees are small, dark-bodied bees that are responsible for a lot of pollination, and they also have a really interesting life history. And I'm going to tell you about part of that now. This is called the tale of the dwarf eldest daughter. Okay, so... Small carpenter bees are stem nesters. And what this means is uh, the mother bee is going to hollow out a, a dead stem or twig, and she's going to create a series of cells where she's going to raise her larvae. And you can see this in the picture at the bottom of the slide. This is a sumac twig that has had one side of it removed to reveal a small carpenter bee nest within. So in the very first nest cell, the mom carpenter bee, she's going to lay a fertilized egg. 
with bees, the fertilized eggs always turn into females. Also in that first cell, she is going to deliberately put less pollen and nectar than she does in any of the other cells. So this means that that daughter bee growing in that cell, eating that pollen and nectar, is going to end up significantly smaller than her siblings. If you look at this top right picture, you can see what I'm talking about. This is that mature little daughter bee on the left compared to her normal size mom. Now, when that little daughter bee is finished maturing, <clears throat> she's in a tricky situation because she's finished her pollen and nectar. She doesn't have anything else to eat. Uh, so she would kind of need to get out of the nest. However, between her and the nest exit are all of her siblings who are in various stages of larval development. They're still developing. They still have more to eat. So what this little bee does is she very carefully pushes through the partitions, separating herself from the rest of the stem. She very politely then puts those partitions back in place, delicately moving past her siblings until she gets to the exit of the stem. It's there she encounters her mother. And her mom says to her dwarf daughter, honey, I need you to go run some errands. And she sends her out at this point to gather pollen and nectar, not just for herself, but for all of her siblings. The pollen and nectar that this dwarf eldest daughter gathers is going to sustain both her and all of her siblings throughout the coming year, because these bees aren't going to emerge until the following springtime. So they need enough food uh, for them to be able to survive the winter. And it's because of this dwarf eldest daughter that they're able to get it done. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a Cinderella story. Uh, and maybe this is the spirit animal to anyone who feels like, um, you know, maybe there was some sibling favoritism uh, in the household at home. Okay, another um, aesthetic aspect, which is really nice about smooth penstemon, um, is in the fall, its leaves turn burgundy. Uh, so just like I was saying before, with the um, wild blue indigo, you know, an extended season of interest because of seed pods, here you have an extended season of interest because of this burgundy coloration. Um, it's not just the trees of the, um, the leaves of the trees that turn color, but also uh, the smooth penstemon does as well. All right, so moving on into the month of July. Um, the flower that I would like to highlight at this point is wild bergamot. So wild bergamot uh, is a really showy flower. It has a really fun look. Um, these uh, kind of like frizzy, exuberant flower heads, um, you know, they have a, a lot of great color to them. And this is another flower that is really adaptable. Um, it can also grow in a range of soil moisture. It has great drought tolerance and it can grow in partial shade or full sun. Um, so this is kind of um, a plant that's not gonna, you know, need a lot of tending to. And it also has um, outstanding wildlife benefits. Let's check in with the bees and see, um, you know, where the, what they're doing when the wild bergamot is in bloom. Okay, so throughout the first part of the month of July, the bumblebee nest is just continuing to grow. So those daughter workers, you know, they're out there gathering more pollen and nectar, bringing it back, uh, feeding the larvae. The mom is laying the eggs, incubating the larvae, and the nest is just continuing to grow, producing more workers uh, to, you know, help with its well-being. Now, during this time, one of the flowers that these worker bees love to forage on is wild bergamot. So wild bergamot is a great example of the long tubular flower structure that I was talking about earlier. The only pollinators that are gonna be attracted to wild bergamot are the long tongued pollinators because they're the only ones who can access the plant's nectar. Most bumblebees have the tongue length uh, necessary to you know, reach the plant's nectaries. And as a result, they love this plant. There was a study done recently uh, within the past few years looking at 
uh, foraging preferences among a wide range of flowers uh, for bumblebees. And wild bergamot came out almost at the top of the list um, as a favored plant. When there are a lot of flowers that are in bloom, the bumblebees will uh, almost certainly choose the wild bergamot. Another pollinator that really likes wild bergamot and is really fun to watch in the garden is um, the hummingbird clearwing moth. So these almost look like a creature out of Greek mythology, uh, you know, like, like a flying lobster or a shrimp, you know, or a cross between a hummingbird and, you know, a crustacean. But um, anyway, what's cool is they remain hovering while they're sipping their nectar. So it's really cool to, you know, watch these uh, insects kind of dart and bob in and among your wild bergamot and wild bergamot will absolutely draw these draw these uh, hummingbird clear wings in. Now, if you want to support the rest of the hummingbird clear wing life cycle, consider planting um, a viburnum shrub in your yard. One of our native viburnums uh, is a host plant that the caterpillars of the hummingbird clear wing can consume. And I would recommend uh, the nanny berry viburnum is a really nice option. If you had nanny berry viburnum in your yard and you also had um, the wild bergamot, it's like the hummingbird clear wing would never have a reason to leave your yard. It would be paradise for them. Okay, another wildlife benefit that the wild bergamot is offering is its stems are one of the favored nesting places for those small carpenter bees I was talking about just a little bit ago. So the dwarf eldest daughter, you know, the maybe manipulative mom, that whole crew, they love to occupy the stems of wild bergamot. And um, the way that you want to uh, kind of maintain your garden in order to encourage the nesting of these bees is leave your stem, go ahead and leave your stems standing uh, throughout the winter, because that's going to provide winter shelter to birds. But then during the month of March, in the springtime, now's a great time, cut those stems to about one to two feet tall. It's those vertical cut stems that these stem nesting bees are going to focus on when they're um, trying to find a new nest site. And I should add that you're not just serving small carpenter bees when you do this, but 20% of our native bees are stem nesting bees. So you're really helping out a large population of bees if you um, maintain your old stems in this manner. All right, so moving on now into the late summer, we're getting into the month of August. Um, the plant that I would highlight for the month of August is um, the tall ironweed. So tall ironweed probably has the most intense purple flowers of any flower that I know of in the state. Um, it's really a sight. Sometimes, um, you know, you'll catch these like dark kind of like areas of color when you're like driving down 71 and that's the, that's a tall ironweed. So it's got a, you know, big magnificent presentation and uh, it can get up to seven feet tall. I would not characterize this as an overly aggressive plant though. Um, it's a plant that, you know, like many of our native plants is going to send up multiple stems kind of like in a, in a, in its, I don't know, from the, the same central base. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, it's certainly, if you have the room to accommodate a large wildflower, this is one I would recommend. Um, in addition to its color, um, this plant is, you know, it's really versatile. Uh, it can adapt to that range of soil moisture I was talking about before. It especially does well in wet places. Um, and it can do part shade or full sun. I will say, though, that the flowering is going to be more impressive in a full sun situation. All right, let's check in with the bumblebees and see what's happening when the tall ironweed is in bloom. Okay, so in late July and then moving on into the month of August, the bumblebee nest is going to start producing males and next year's queens. Up to now, it was only producing those female workers. Uh, but now it's going to produce the males. And here we have a male pictured on the left. It can, uh, for a common eastern bumblebee, the male can be identified 
by a blonde mustache and the lack of a pollen basket on its back leg. The nest is also producing next year's queens. The next year's queens can be identified by their larger size in comparison to the other bees. They get big like this because the mom gives them more to eat when they're in their larval form. And they need this extra body mass because these are the bees that are gonna carry the torch into the next year and uh, keep the bumblebee population going. So um, after these bees um, leave the nest, really what they're gonna be focusing on is trying to mate with bees from other nests. And um, you know that's really uh, you know, what they're thinking about. The male bee, once he leaves, he's not coming back. The uh, next year's queen though, she will return uh, to her current year's nest while she's you know, in the process of out looking, process of searching for a mate. Now, while these bees are out and about, one of their favorite plants to visit is the tall ironweed. The uh, flower structure on tall ironweed is a medium tubular structure. So to a lesser degree than the wild bergamot, this plant is kind of isolating uh, its pollinator population to the long-tongued pollination. It's excluding some of those shorter-tongued bees who won't be able to access its floral rewards. And therefore, it has extra value uh, to these foraging uh, long-tongued bumblebees. The other organisms that love tall ironweed are butterflies, especially uh, eastern tiger swallowtails. So I have been in meadows before uh, with a lot of you know flowers in bloom, the eastern tiger swallowtails will go from one tall ironweed to another, seemingly ignoring the other flowers that are in bloom. Now there's a characteristic of butterflies that's kind of true worldwide that butterflies like to visit plants that have nectar that's high in amino acids. Um, this amino acid rich nectar has been shown to increase the fecundity of the butterfly. So butterflies who uh, consume a lot of this amino acid rich nectar, they're able to uh, lay more eggs. So, you know, this is why they like it. There was a study done uh, just a few years ago looking at the amino acid content of a number of native wildflowers. And it turns out the tall ironweed has the highest concentration of amino acids of all of the native wildflowers tested. So this very well could be an explanation for why the Eastern tiger swallowtails love to visit the tall ironweed. Another uh, wildlife related characteristic of this plant is it's highly resistant to mammalian herbivory. So deer, rabbits, other mammals, they don't like to eat the foliage of tall ironweed because uh, it has uh, compounds in it that are toxic and distasteful. So for this reason, it has, uh, you know, the tendency to become almost over overpopulated in pastures because the cows and the horses want to avoid it. And you can see that's exactly what's happening here in this picture. But it's a great trait for a uh, wildflower in your garden, especially if you have um, a lot of, uh, you know, deer herbivory happening. Another thing about the tall ironweed is that intense purple flower. It's a beautiful complement to yellow flowers that are blooming at the same time. And in particular, uh, a wildflower called wingstem, which is almost like the sister plant to tall ironweed. They oftentimes grow side by side in nature and uh, they really complement one another in terms of their uh, flower coloration. Okay, so now finally, uh, moving to the late growing season, we're getting into the month of September and the wildflower I would highlight for this month is a goldenrod. So this is a gray goldenrod, also known as dwarf goldenrod. And the goldenrods, uh, there should be one goldenrod in everybody's garden because goldenrods are what's called keystone plants. Keystone plants like goldenrods have a disproportionate effect on biodiversity. Um, goldenrods support over a hundred different species of caterpillars and they also support, uh, it's something like 30 or 40 different species of specialist bees. So goldenrods are great for the garden. Uh, a lot of people are wary of goldenrods because um, some of them can be aggressive and take over. 
It's not the case with the dwarf goldenrod. This is a very garden friendly goldenrod. It only grows to about two feet tall. It's not an aggressive spreader. Um, it's a lovely plant for the home garden. This uh, plant is going to uh, do very well on dry soils as well. So just like a uh, little blue stem, uh, just like the wild blue indigo, um, it's gonna do well in those dry drought prone spaces. And um, the flower head for the size of the plant is pretty big. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty um, showy plant. You're gonna wanna plant this one in full sun though, I should say. Okay, so let's check in with our uh, bumblebees, see what's happening with them. Okay, so it's September, it's time to mate. Um, so those next year's queens and those drones, they've left the nest and it looks like they found a mate from another nest. So they're gonna go ahead and they're going to mate and the uh, drones, they're just going to you know, live out the rest of the year out in the field, continuing to visit wildflowers. The um, next year's queens, what they're gonna do is they're gonna search for a spot where they can hibernate over the winter. Usually what they do is they uh, dig down a couple inches into the soil and they hibernate in a small cavity in the soil uh, which they have excavated. So when they're prior to doing this, they're gonna need to build up their fat reserves so they can survive the winter. Uh, one of the plants that they're gonna love to do that with is dwarf goldenrod. These next year's queens, they're really the ones who are going to carry on uh, the, the bumblebee population because all of the other bees, the drones, the workers, the queens of the current year, they're all gonna die uh, with the first frost, but it's these next year's queens who are gonna you know, pass the torch on to the uh, next generation. Like I was saying, as they're building up those fat stores for the wintertime, um, goldenrods are some of the premier plants that they're gonna wanna forage on. Another species that loves the goldenrods is the blue-winged wasp. So this is a really handsome pollinator. And, uh, you know, I just love to see these uh, against that bright yellow of the goldenrod. They also love bone sets, um, but really a beautiful species. And these guys have the extra benefit of uh, being parasitic on lawn grubs. So if you have, um, you know, maybe an overpopulation of green June beetles, these guys will take care of it because their larvae are gonna consume the green June beetle larvae. Um, and also there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that these will also target Japanese beetles. So, you know, it can't hurt. Um, attracting the blue winged wasp to your yard, uh, which is a non-aggressive wasp, by the way, um, might help in um, minimizing the presence of those Japanese beetles. Another pollinator that absolutely loves goldenrods are the green metallic sweat bees. These are like flying jewels. They're some of the most beautiful of our native bees. And unlike a lot of solitary bees um, that are kind of building their own individual nest, these bees will kind of work together and nest communally. So there will be one shared entrance and then lots of um, side branches where the individual females are doing their own thing, taking care of their own larvae. And this is sort of like a bee apartment building um, or a bee hotel. So if you want to um, encourage, you know, a bee hotel in your own yard, you just need to leave a patch of bare soil because 70% um, of our native bees are actually ground nesting bees and they're going to make use of a space like that. Um, so um, other than, you know, these green metallic sweat bees, there are uh, the mining bees, um, small sweat bees, a whole variety, they're gonna benefit from that exposed bare ground to build their nest. Okay, well, that rounds up um, the uh, overview of native plants and um, how they support the bumblebee life cycle. Uh, I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, so 
almost so all or nearly all of the plants that were featured in today's presentation are available uh, at Meadow City Nursery where I work. And we're at um, East 152nd and Waterloo in Cleveland. Um, if you're coming uh, from the West, uh, we're right next to the East 152nd second exit, um, right by 90. So it's a, a really convenient location. And um, we're gonna be opening up in May. We'll be open by Mother's Day. Um, we would love to see you. And uh, we also have a website. So you can go online and kind of uh, peruse our selection. But th thanks again uh, for, um, you know, inviting me and, uh, you know, so that I could uh, share this information with everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. I took a lot of notes during your presentation. It was awesome. Oh, great. Yeah. So I think I'm going to open it up to questions right now. So if anyone has a question, feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, I have one to start off with. Um, which I think is in reference to goldenrod, someone asked if, what if their clays are very clay rich? Do goldenrod grow well in that? Okay. Type? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, I think oftentimes the, the way that the soil texture is going to be influencing whether or not plants grow is gonna be indirectly through its effect on the moisture. So if your clay soil is a place where uh, water is frequently ponding, then a plant like the gray goldenrod is not gonna be good because it does better in average or dry soils. But if your clay is one that is oftentimes, you know, cracked and dry and droughty, then uh, yeah, I think that the gray goldenrod could be a good choice for you. And, um, at Meadow City, we have um, like half a dozen different goldenrods. And there's one called uh, grass-leaved goldenrod that specifically does well in clay soils. There was research that showed that as the clay concentration of the soil increased, grass-leaved goldenrod became more competitive. Um, you know, and then we have others uh, like uh, wrinkle-leaved goldenrod um, is another one that you know, tends to do well in wetter zones. The short answer is there's a goldenrod for every every growing situation. And I think that we uh, indeed have goldenrods that could do well in your clay soil. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess the next question I have is someone's planning on pre-ordering some plants from Meadow City. Um, uh -huh. And they asked, um, do you have any recommendations for natives that would do well in pots for renters? Oh, Okay. All right, let's see here. Um, yeah, there, you know what? Basically any of our, I would say any of our smaller plants, so like uh, three feet in size and smaller um, are gonna, you know, be appropriate for the pot. Now you're gonna, um, you're gonna wanna get a fairly wide pot because um, like once, the kind of like canopy of the plant is like significantly broader than the pot, then you want to move on to the next pot size. So you want to get a fairly wide pot, but yeah, any of our like um, shorter plants, like for instance, the um, yeah, the gray goldenrod would be a really nice one. Um, we have a plant called uh, Allegheny monkey flower that could be a good choice. We have a plant called, um, Oh, Jacob's Ladder is a spring bloomer, and that's really beautiful. Um, so, uh, yeah, but any of those, oh, um, oh, let's see here. What's it called? Um, Nodding Wild Onion is uh, a really pretty one. Purple Coneflower. Um, these would all be good choices. Um, you're really just going to want to restrict your search to uh, plants that are kind of like, I don't know, maybe under three feet in size. Awesome, sorry, I had issues unmuting myself there. Um, perfect, okay. thank you. Um, another question I have, um, someone put up bee pollinator houses last year but didn't see much happening. Can you give them some tips, please? They're facing east and south. 
Okay. Now, um, I must admit, I have not had experience with the with the bee pollinator house. Um, but I will say that what's going to draw the bees in is the flowers. So um, specifically, flower clusters that are greater than three feet wide have been shown to get a bee's attention. So um, you're going to want to, uh, you know, maybe your native plants, it's good to like plant them by species in clusters so that they can like, um, I don't know, like maybe if you have some dwarf goldenrod growing and you also have some wild bergamot growing, it's good to keep the wild bergamot together, keep the dwarf goldenrod together, etc. And therefore you're gonna create these larger flower clusters that the bees are gonna notice. And then once they're in the area, um, you know, that's when they're gonna be looking for uh, the nesting habitat to establish those nests. And if you have, um, if you've attracted the bees that want to go in those like hollow stem nests, um, then yeah, that, that would be the way is to try and draw them in with the wildflowers. I'm sorry, I don't have a more specific answer for what bees are going to be going into those nests. I want to say, uh, I want to say leaf cutter bees, um, you know, are drawn to those like kind of cavity bee houses. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, just generally speaking, drawing those, drawing those bees in with the wildflowers is the way to do it. Awesome. Sweet. Um, so I think we have time for one more question and then we're going to turn it over to Ohio Native Plant Month. Um, so I am going to actually put Dave's email in the chat for any questions that we didn't get to. Um, you can feel free to email Dave and I'm certain that he can get your question answered. Um, so the last question I have here is, do you carry any flowers for bog areas of ponds? Well, you know, we certainly have a lot of wetland adapted plants. We've got a, a whole section of the nursery is devoted to plants that do well in um, wet areas. So, um, yeah, we should we should definitely have uh, plants that are going to want to grow under those conditions. Um, now, for bogs specifically, I mean, that is kind of a uh, sort of a, a niche kind of like set of, um, you know, conditions, but broadly speaking, we have a lot of wetland plants. Um, the monkey flower that I mentioned, hollow Joe pie weed, uh, common bone set, the, um, you know, wrinkle leaf goldenrod, round leaf goldenrod, cut leaf, uh, cone flower. Um, we've got a bunch. So I, I think that, you know, you could find something for your space. Um, just perusing what we have at the nursery. It's kind of a focus of ours, the wetland adapted plants, because there's so many um, wetland areas in Northeast Ohio. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you for your presentation and for answering all those questions. It was wonderful. Um, yeah, so Thanks, yeah, no problem. Uh, so we're at 1.31 now, so we're going to wrap up questions. Um, if you didn't get your question answered, you again, you can feel free to send an email to Dave. I threw his email in the chat, and I'll do that once more um, before we end the webinar. Um, so yeah, I wanted to thank Dave and everyone else for coming and, and participating in the webinar. Um, I'll be sending up a follow-up email with information about the recording link and a short survey that I would super appreciate if you'd fill out. It helps me a lot with the data I have to report on as an Alcor member, and it is really short. I um, so yes, for anyone that has to leave, thank you so much. Um, but if you'd like to stay on for the brief 10-minute uh, bonus talk from Ohio Native Plant Month, I am going to hand it off to the people there. Um, so Hope, um, if you'd like to uh, turn your camera on and unmute yourself, you have the floor. We'll wrap up at about 1.40 p.m. Thank you very much, Nada. And thank you, Dave. Uh, the Ohio Heritage Garden, which is at the governor's residence, is redoing its pollinator garden this year. And I got lots of information from you. So uh, hopefully someone will be contacting you uh, about some of your wonderful plants.
Great. Um, I am also uh, one of the co-founders of the Ohio, April is Ohio Native Plant Month. And several years ago, we got the legislature to pass a uh, bill, which the Governor DeWine signed, making April the official Native Plant Month in Ohio. Since then, we are trying to make that uh, a national month uh, for a focus on native plants. So if you're interested in supporting that, please go to www.nationalnativeplantmonth.org and, and sign up. Otherwise, you can go to uh, April is Ohio Native Plant Month um, org and um, see all the information that we have there. One of the things that is helpful to a lot of people is that it um, has a list, uh, including the Meadow City Native Plant Nursery, where you can go and get uh, native plants in your part of the state. Each year we focus on uh, four plants that are indigenous to Ohio that uh, should be in your garden or close there around. And if you have any influence on other spaces, please think about planting them. And this year in two, 2024 um, is the tulip poplar and the winter berry holly and wood poppy and honeysuckle vine. You can find the ones for 2022, 23 and 24 all on the website. And each was um, picked because they are native to the area. Um, they are popular with pollinators and they are pretty in your yard. And uh, as you all know, the tulip poplar is really not a popular, it's a magnolia, but it's it's a, um, it's gorgeous tulip-like uh, flowers are just about ready to bloom now. The winter berry will give you color all year long and um, the wood poppy is uh, bright in the yellow in the woodland areas in the springtime. Um, and the honeysuckle vine will grow all year and um, is great for honey, hummingbirds and other pollinators. So if you have any questions, um, please let Nina know. But most of all, do what you can do to support the use of native plants and indigenous plants um, in the month of April and then through all out the year. Because um, to us, if you don't um, nurture the uh, indigenous plants of the area, you don't get the pollinators. And if you don't get the pollinators, you don't get the food that we all need. So it's very important that we uh, nurture the pollinators and the native plants so that we all can eat because um, that's pretty important, uh, as, you can, as you can imagine. I, I like to eat and I bet you do too, uh, but there are a lot of resources and available uh, um, things to help you promote uh, April as Native Plant Month on the website, and I hope that you will do that. Awesome. And I hope that you've heard me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Hope. Um, I will definitely be keeping natives in my thoughts throughout the whole month of April and, of course, past the month of April all year long. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for coming on and talking a little bit. I will also go ahead, um, I'll include Hope's email in my follow-up um, as well um, and her website and all of that. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Dave. Thank you, Hope, and thank you, thank everyone. You joining today um yeah uh you'll just be on the lookout for a follow-up email from me um, right and the recording link if you want to read uh, uh, there is a message here in the chat about japanese honey honeysuckle that is not our native uh honey, honeysuckle vine which uh, is much more uh behaved and uh, is much more um liked by um our pollinators. So uh, make sure you know the difference and that you look for the um, honeysuckle vine that is um, indigenous to this area, which is basically red on the outside and uh, yellow on the inside. That is an excellent note. Yeah, we don't want to be planting invasives. <laughs> no, we don't. We have enough of those around. 
Exactly. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and wrap it up then. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.